about 40 minutes before official sunrise, the quail will wake up. They'll basically do their reveille call. It goes That's the teenager right there at the end. It was about this time of the year, June, there was a bird that was whistling out in our backyard. And my mom said, do you hear that bird? It calls its name, Bob White. Well, that was when I was five years old. 58 years later, it's still calling to me. I can remember the 1963 gold rocket Chevrolet Impala 327 four barrel and if you ever mashed on the gas from the United parking lot to the stoplight you could use 11 gallons and it wasn't but a block, you know, until he got that 396 at SS and then he was styling pretty good. Him and Coon Dog hit the town, they, all the women was chasing them then. He saw me one evening, so he pulled us over and we met like that. And yeah. then dad said that he, mom made him sell it for diapers. No. So. <laughs> in 1974, I had to get married. In 1974, it meant there was probably a shotgun involved. I'm quick to point out it had nothing to do with the maternal status of my bride-to-be. My future father-in-law had the best quail hunting in Harmon County, and I had to marry into that. <laughs> As a hunter, you, you enjoy those early sunrises. You enjoy all the sounds and the sights and it's just a, a very special uh, cinematography. You know, it's Technicolor all the way. Dale was two years older than me, and he was one that really taught me the patience of hunting, uh, what it took to be not just a hunter, it's not about the hunt, it's about the experience of getting to go. You go 100 miles east of Highway 83 and, and wild quail are, are gone. So what went awry? So I began to think, okay, you know, I, I could put together a core of young people and, and train them. And we want them to understand what I call patternology, the ability to look at your environment and be able to say, what's the issue here? What's the problem? Because we got to know that, define it before we can address it. So I call quail the canary of the prairie. It's the canary of the prairie. Something that's good for Bob Whites is good for a lot of other species of grassland birds. He wanted to start this to be an advocate for quail and be an advocate for outdoors. Hey, hello, hello, Bob White Brigade. Water seven in the shade. try to assign a nickname to each one of them. He's a nickname person. My nickname was Pyro. My nickname is Canis Macarenas. I think he called me the Gibner. My nickname is Advil. My nickname, oh my goodness. I, I don't know if I can say it. <laughs> I've made it thus far without a nickname, so don't put that on there. It's kind of a friendly way of saying, you know, we like you. Our motto is tell me and I forget, show me and I remember, involve me and I understand. You know, I was kind of skeptical those first two days. I was like, what in the world are we doing? We're marching these kids around in 106 degree weather. They're sleeping three hours a night for five days. Like, there's no way these kids are enjoying this. They're constantly being pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed, but they keep coming back. And then on the fifth day, it all kind of makes sense to you, you know? And it all gets synthesized down. Then you're like, man, these, these kids are eating this stuff up. I mean, we're turning them into not only conservationists, but just people, like just good people. When you look at kids today, they're inheriting a much worse situation than what you and I had, and they're gonna have to be smarter and think harder and work more cooperatively and communicate better. So we like to think that we've given them ammunition for life when they go through one of these camps. That causes a real ripple effect. I think that the kids that are 14 and 15, 16 now, think about when they're in their 30s and 40s what kind of passion they can have for wildlife. I always tell people at the end of five days of Bob Brigade, I am physically worn out, but I'm emotionally supercharged. Gonna be, wanna be, wanna be, need to be, baby be.
working on the parasite issue for four years. The insects are the intermediate host, grasshoppers, crickets. And when a quail eats that insect, a parasite, it's in the aviary canals of the bobwhite and in its eye within 15 minutes. The stated mission of the Research Foundation is to preserve wild quail hunting for this generation and future generations. We have just completed all the work of the FDA, the approval of the first drug for distribution to a wild bird. We can distribute this feed to wild quail and clean them of parasites. And that's a radical thing that never would have happened had it not been for Dale's vision, his courage, and his persistence. She you know, I mean, he can sell a tomato popsicle to a woman in white gloves. We called him a Pied Piper. He was always one that we called the philosopher in the family. He's tough, and it's a lot of tough love. And, uh, and he comes in a room, and you just kind of feel everything pick up a little bit, you know? And he has this weird way of making everybody want to be just a little bit better, you know? There'll never be another Dale Rollins. <laughs> My hope is that uh, 100 years from now, people are still talking about quail. You hope that you've inspired the, the next generation or the next two generations. Well, I think if people really, really look at Dale and they, they, they know him as the quail guy, the, the research guy, but uh, I think a thing that they might not know about him is just his passion for life. You know, it's, he, he's a hunter, but he's hunted life and he has done well at it. Without Dale Rollins, we would be without quail and nobody really taking much of an interest in it. I've taken the, the stance that, again, not on my watch, not in West Texas, not in the rolling plains, which I have a strong fidelity to. 